Hello, this is the Stereosource user guide video. In the first section we'll look at the user interface and how to, uh, how to operate the, the software. And in the second part we'll look at some of the processing options and some of the theoretical background. Right, so welcome to the first part of the Stereosource user guide video uh, relating to the user interface and how to use the software. So if we open the software up here, you get the main window. It's very straightforward. The software is designed to be straightforward and also to have many built-in prompts. So you'll see that. You can see there it's actually telling you this table list, the audio files that have been selected. And that's typical of the whole uh, interface that there are always these prompts everywhere in it selecting the post-process. This tells you that the output file format and how it can be used. So you can see that this is the intention here is that you've always got uh, prompts to help you um, to help you round, around the software. Now I'm not going to talk about the various different filters uh, in this part because that's covered in the second part of the, of the video. So this is really just about how to use the UI. So the main boxes along the top here, the main menus, this relates to the, to the process that we, want to, that we want to undertake using the software. Um, and you can see there a pop-out which quite extensively explains what the, what the various parts do, what the various filters do. Uh, you can see Frankenstein, for instance, it will tell you it's the studio, stereo enhancement, this is the original. It'll tell you what cross fours are. Um, so lots of those prompts all over it. So this relates to the, to the initial process. Um, the, and the second part here relates to a post process, in this case the groove process. And the, the third window here relates to the output file format. We can accept input files in WAV, AIFF and AIFFC and FLAC. Um, and you can simply make things unchanged if you like or you can convert the file type on output. Um, it's quite useful because if you had none and none here you can simply use this as for instance a WAV to FLAC converter and FLAC to WAV converter so it's quite useful just as a, as a file converter. Uh, down the bottom windows here we have a file name suffix which we can uh, insert and that changes in relation to the to the filter that we've chosen so that gives you some ability to identify what you've actually um, what you've actually treated just very straightforwardly by looking at the filter suffix. Um, uh, that's explained. Uh, then the folder that the um, that the file is that the converted file is is stored in is is user defined all the same as the source file. In the case here, I've set it as the desktop, and you can simply browse to put it somewhere else if you want to. But it's it's useful for us to see the desktop because uh, you can see the files appearing. Right. Uh, the other important part of the interface is related to the preferences dialogues. So that opens up and there are three pages of this. The first page, the general page, uh, relates to files and folders, whether you want to see the extension. Uh, the second part relates to clipping management. There's gain in many of these filters and so consequently the converted file can actually have an amplitude greater than the input file relating um, and that can cause clipping. Um, and you can uh, opt to, to uh, deal with that in various ways, either to clip the file or to attenuate the entire file to prevent any clipping. Uh, and then there's a warning, you can get it to warn when this is going to happen so that you can make your decision at that particular time how you want to treat it. And you can set that in this dialogue here. I've got it set at 0.1 dB, which is quite low, um, but I think for most high quality applications you'll want to know very early that you're running into clipping. Uh, down the bottom here we have audio metrics and that relates to whether we're calculating the loudness of the files relating to the uh, EBU recommendation 128 algorithms, uh, whether we put that information in uh, metadata in the broadcast wave format um, and then we have an adjustable loudness here. You can set the target loudness uh, with this slider and we have, inf we have advice on where best to set that um, in, the, in the help files. Uh, settings uh, relate to some of the filters and how we deal with them. Um, the first part here relates to the phonograph uh, EQ, um, whether we treat it as a stereo disc, as a mono disc, or as a damaged or noisy disc. We have various different ways of dealing with that, uh, dealing with those input signals uh, to, to maximize the benefit of the software. You can put in the needle scratch filter, perhaps if you're converting 78s, and the spatial rumble filter, which is a, the linear phase um, high pass filter. Uh, Ambisonics uh, decoders come in various flavors that's explained in the help files in the second part of this video and that's where you would choose what uh, what decoder you want for Ambisonics. Uh, Dither 
obviously we normally uh, all the output of stereo source is dithered uh, with triangular probident probability density function noise um, you can opt to switch that off to to, in to to speed up the conversion process but I think most people want to keep that on um, these two sliders here relate to the groove uh, processing and the model uh, which is the uh, this is the model which uh, this is the, the mathematical model which models the effect of a stylus moving in the groove and you can set that according to whether it's low normal high uh, maximum in the middle uh, the the models are set to typical values for a 12 inch 33 so you can either have a bit more distortion perhaps relating to a 45 record or a bit less which will give you a model very close to an 18 inch 33 disc um, Remember that 33 RPM records were actually made for moving picture sound and the original ones were 18 inch. So if you want to know what they sounded like, you can put it there. Uh, and then the last page just is a table showing you what features are available in which versions of the, of the software. And that's covered in the second part of the video too. So that really covers uh, the main part, uh, the main parts of the software. Uh, the only other thing to talk about is the help files. And if you look in Stereosource help here, uh, you have a very complete set of help, what stereo source, which processing fields to use, and there's lots of background information. Uh, it tells you about uh, flat phono preamplifiers if you need to do them, how to modify uh, standard interfaces, even how to modify uh, existing phono preamplifiers if you want to in order to, to get uh, flat phono recordings. Okay, so now on to the main part of the, uh, of the, of the interface. We can just look at doing um, just doing straightforward file conversion so I've just got some test material in here it doesn't really matter what that is um, just got some music so, right, so I'll just put that disk there so you simply drag the the file you wish to convert over to this table you can see here the source file name the kind of audio it is the status it has um, and I'm going to Frankenstein convert this I think that's just and not for any particular reason, just to, because it gives a good example of what's happening. Um, in that case, the FR suffix is attached. I'm going to store it to the desktop just so we can see it arrive. And in this case, I want to convert it to WAV audio on the output. So uh, I simply do convert, analyzing source metrics. That's now doing the uh, loudness measurements, which actually takes quite a long time. And then it's adding to the noise, analyzing the converted. That's again doing the loudness on the converted file. Right, and you can see the, the file has now turned orange in the interface showing that it's been done and it's appeared here on the, on the output interface. So I can listen to that if I want to. Right, now also one of the things that's interesting here, if you want to copy the audio metrics to the clipboard, now I've done that with a right click. If we open up a text editor, um, in the last ones I've done this, the same thing. So if I now do paste, there we go. You can see all the metrics. These are related to the uh, the metrics um, for spatial uh, processing and also for the for the loudness. So you can see that the loudness values are set here, the loudness range, um, and how it was all calculated. Good. So we've looked at individual uh, files being converted in the stereo source uh, interface. Now we're going to look at a whole CD. I've loaded a, a CD into my CD drive. It's been recognized there. Um, and in this case, I want to apply Headspace. I want to make a version for headphone listening. Um, and I want the output in, for argument's sake, in, in WAV audio. Okay, so I'm going to see, you can see now the, the, uh, the tracks. I'm only going to take a few of them because it's a bit easier to see. Um, so there we are. Um, I'm going to apply headspace in there. Um, so I start to convert them. You can see it starts to read the file. That takes quite a long time because it's getting it off a CD. That's quite a slow process. You'll see that takes a little time. And once that read has done, you'll see the other parts of the algorithm being applied. Right, now that's interesting because this particular algorithm has some gain uh, and it's noticed that uh, a very few number, 0.1% of the audio samples need to be clamped. Um, uh, clamped basically means clipping, so uh, we can force an attenuation over the track to, to avoid that clipping, which is what I'm going to do. Right, now it's now done that. 
and that's now available. If I wanted to listen to that track, it's, it's still reading, but I can play that converted file in the interface. You can see the other files there. Right, so it's on this next file it's doing the same thing. I'm going to attenuate that as well. That's enough for that. So uh, you can now see, and the files are appearing here because I've set them on the desktop. Once again, you wouldn't normally do that, I, I doubt, but uh, it's just easier to see the way they, they arrive like that. And that really is the, uh, is the ability to do sort of batch processing, which greatly um, facilitates if you've got lots of tracks to do. Uh, in each case, in, in, uh, each time I've chosen here to uh, to ask what to do from now on, but I can actually say, look, I always wanted to clamp or I always wanted to attenuate from now on. In this case, I'm going to just do it again. And there you are. There's the the final one. There we are, so they are all finished within that interface. Normally they'd be in their own folder, of course. And that concludes the first part of the Stereosource user guide video. Okay, so on to part two of uh, the Frankenstein user guide video. Uh, now we'll look at the, the various filter options um, in the software and some of the theoretical background to them. So this is looking at the, uh, the Frankenstein first. This was the original Frankenstein hardware version developed in the, the end of the 1990s, intended as a stereo enhancement circuit. It was called enhancement, which is probably a bad term, actually. It should have been called stereo correction matrix. We'll look at some of the historical background to that. So here is a picture of Alan Dowler Blumlein, uh, electronics genius, inventor of the cathode follower, amongst other things, uh, and pretty much the inventor of the analog television uh, system. Um, very sadly died in the Second World War, developing radar. Um, but in 1928 to 1932, he did a lot of experiments on what he called binaural sound, which was the basis of, uh, of all stereo recording today. Uh, with his death, the, um, it fell to his team to, to develop the, the stereo system, the commercial stereo system at the end of the 50s. Um, and that team included Clark, Dutton and Vanderlin. And they wrote a very famous paper called, uh, calling it the Stereosonic Recording and Reproducing System. Um, and uh, that really set the theoretical background to... Uh, and explained in detail how a, a full stereo system from microphone to um, to, to, to um, microgroove recording uh, apparatus would work and did work. Uh, in the process of their of developing the system, they did a lot of listening tests, and this was the configuration they used. It's a very familiar 30 degrees left, 30 degrees right, loudspeakers, just as we use today. Slightly, slightly big listening room with 10 feet between the, between the speakers, but very much, uh, very familiar from today. Uh, the essence of the EMI system, or Blumline system, one should say, is that the um, stereo was encoded, encoded purely by intensity ratio between the left and right channel. That's to say that if you wanted a, a sound to appear fully left, the left loudspeaker would be sounding and the right loudspeaker would be silent. Um, but if you wanted the centre, they would both be sounding, and if you wanted it partially left, the left would, uh, loudspeaker would be stronger than the right loudspeaker. The, the sound would be, would be louder coming out of the left-hand speaker than the right-hand speaker. But there wouldn't be any timing differences between the signals, and there wouldn't be any phase differences. So it's a relatively straightforward system where it is purely interchannel intensity ratio that sets the stereo position. And although it's quite simple um, electronically, it actually creates quite a, a complex situation psychophysically, which is why it's such a clever system. This um, paragraph is from the original Stereosonic paper, um, and I won't read it slavishly, but what it says was is that 
below 700 hertz in their subjective listening tests, they got very good correlation with the mathematical model that they put together. So they did a full um, uh, model of the of how the system worked in terms of the intensities and how they added phases at the ears and uh, and, and whatnot. And that then produced a very good uh, a very good and solid theoretical model, which was tested in listening tests and below 700 hertz worked very well indeed. But above 700 hertz, that the model didn't predict where the where the percept where the where the particular image um, would appear to subjectively. So, so in essence, um, we have a situation like this that, uh, for instance, if they had a low frequency sound with a given uh, ratio between the left and right speakers, it might appear there, for instance, but a, a high frequency sound uh, with the same ratio would appear more exaggerated, wider, if you like. So if it was towards the left for the low frequency sound, it would be more towards the left for the high frequency sound. If it was to the right for the low frequency sound, it would be more towards the right for the high frequency sound. And uh, this is a, a composite of curves which I've plotted from various different researchers. The ones here are Clark, uh, because he's the main author. Um, and you can see here that on the bottom of the, the, bottom of the screen, which is the the horizontal axis, we're looking at inter-channel level difference, and uh, the vertical axis, we're looking at percentage of the stage width. So the biggest percentage, obviously, is 50%, because that's fully left or fully right. And so for a, diff for a particular inter-channel level difference, you can imagine drawing a line up from the bottom axis, and it crosses the blue line, which is his LF result, uh, way before it crosses the that the HF, so the HF is, is wider, it's, it's further on, out on the stage width for a given intensity ratio than the LF. Now if you look at them, uh, Leakey was another researcher and you can see exactly the same pattern there, uh, and Vent is another researcher and he, his pattern is even more strong, so the, but they all show that high frequency has a much steeper curve than the low frequency. The differences incidentally are due to the fact the differences in the way the tests were made and whether people were allowed to move their heads or not. So that's just a detail. But the important thing is that all researchers show that high frequency image is always wider than low frequency image. Um, and this is a, uh, an image which I put together to try and put some sort of, uh, I don't know, analogy together with light. So uh, here we have a, a picture with the red components, which are the low frequencies, which is narrower than the blue frequencies, which are the high frequencies, the blue, the blue light, which is the high frequencies. And you can see this a smearing effect, which is analogous, in fact, to chromatic aberration in a lens. And so the, the stereo system, uh, based entirely on interchannel intensity ratios, has this smeared effect, has this uh, aberration at, at low frequency and high frequency. Now in no way did Clark, Dutton and Vanderlin regard this smearing at uh, high and low frequencies as an acceptable uh, compromise for their stereo system and they set about a very clever way of compensating for it. And what they found was is that if they derived a sum signal, that's left plus right, and, uh, and a different signal, that's left minus right, and then filtered the different signal um, above 700 cycles per second, they could maintain perceptual register right across the frequency range. Uh, and they called this circuit a shuffler, because it was shuffling the stereo image slightly in relation to frequency. Um, that was all well and good. Um, but, and that is actually their, their circuit actually shown at the bottom of this slide, um, the left-hand part being the, the frequency dependent, that's the filter, the network. Um, uh, but having done that, they then had to matrix the signals back to left and right again, and they needed phase compensation to do that, which is what's happening in the right-hand part of that circuit. And we shall return to that, because that was the part that caused the problems later on, and uh, eventually, if you like, caused the shuffle to fall into into disgrace and uh, ignominy. 
So they considered this shuffler as an indispensable part of the stereo system and it was incorporated in the, in the very famous RED 37 and RED 51 mixers which were developed for EMI stereo recordings, studio recordings. Um, the 51 is the one illustrated here. Sometimes that's called the Beatles mixer because it was the mixer that was used to record all the significant Beatles records uh, throughout their career. Um, and in fact, this next uh, quote actually comes from a document which is the user manual or the, the manual for the RED 51 mixer. And it's got a very good explanation of the shuffler. And it says the action of the shuffler can best be explained as follows. Suppose that an instrument is located halfway between the extreme left of the center. When notes of a very low frequency are played on this instrument, all is well. But when higher and higher notes are played, it appears to move out towards the left just as I showed with the crosses earlier on. The shuffler counteracts this effect by taking a little of the higher frequency signals away from the left-hand channel and applying them to the right-hand channel. In this way, the apparent angle of the source is made to remain constant with increase in frequency. So that was what the shuffler did. It was a very ingenious system it was too. But there were problems with the way they'd implemented it. Um, and this is, too is from the, the manual with interestingly handwritten annotations added to it. So, um, and the, the problems that they experienced was not being able to accurately enough compensate for the phase um, distortions caused by the filtering of the difference channel. And it's interesting to say that the, the original manual read the phase change on both channels will then be identical, but someone has added added almost identical and there will be no relative phase change between them there will be substantially no relative phase change between them and these handwritten annotations speak volumes really for the problems that they had in this implementation and in fact it's fair to say that um, the um, the shufflers fell out of use actually way before um, the red mixers were, were scrapped because um, the, the problems caused by this phase distortion caused tonal problems called uh, audio coloration um, and the engineers adopted more and more to switch the shufflers out of circuit because they thought well it's better they took a compromise that it was better to compromise the stereo image than to um, than to you know put up with with coloration audio coloration but when the mixers were scrapped unceremoniously at the end of the 60s, the red mixers, um, really the shufflers were lost forever and almost entirely forgotten. Or at least it was until Frankenstein rediscovered it in the, the end of the 90s. And uh, I took the, some of those ideas and, and put them back into a, into a different circuit configuration. The difference with Frankenstein isn't what it did. Uh, it was the way it did it. So what Frankenstein did was use a crosstalk mechanism, a relatively straightforward crosstalk mechanism, to, to, to achieve exactly the same effect that the uh, EMI shufflers had done. With the difference that by doing it via crosstalk, um, it was impossible to create any kind of audio coloration. You weren't trying to derive things, matrix things, filter them and rematrix them, which was a fairly fraught uh, methodology whereas Frankenstein used a crosstalk um, methodology which was transparent. So now we look at the Bride of Frankenstein. The Bride of Frankenstein is a, is a revised version of the original Frankenstein, which was developed about 15 years later, um, so only a few years ago, um, and was a result of really being able to do um, various computer modeling techniques that weren't available to me at least at the end of the 1990s. Um, and it's best explained by a series of graphs in fact. So it, these three graphs on the left is an untreated stereo system and once again like the curves we looked at earlier we have intensity, intensity differences on the on the x-axis on the on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis we have in this case degrees so at the extreme it's 30 degrees that being the 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 maximum degree that you can have uh, because the speakers at 30 degrees from the listening position um, and you can see again um, these curves are derived from from some later theoretical work um, uh, and, and the mathematical models for hf and lf 
uh, position. Um, and you can see there that the purple curve, which is the HF image, is steeper than the blue curve, which is the, the LF image. So once again, for a given intensity difference, an HF sound is, is more towards the speaker uh, where there's the imbalance than the low frequency sound is. Um, the middle curve actually shows the result of Frankenstein processing upon that. And interestingly enough, although it's a lot better, especially during the, in the central section, which is the, clearly the most important part, it actually slightly overcooks the, the required correction and actually ends up putting the uh, high frequencies actually inside the low frequencies. Now, quite possibly there's a very good reason for this, and I'll come to that later, but uh, that does show that the, the Frankenstein itself was, was actually slightly overcooking the correction, as indeed was the original EMI uh, circuit. Um, so the, the Bride of Frankenstein, using, as I said, new optimization techniques, we were able to get an exact match over, the, over virtually the entire stereo stage width so that the HF and LF positions are exactly in register. So, is there any space now we have Bride of Frankenstein for the original Frankenstein? Well, yes there is. We, in effectively, we have a, a Frankenstein for all occasions. Um, there are two ways of making stereo recordings. One is either a, a pan-potted stereo, as it's called, or entirely artificial stereo. Uh, and in that case, uh, there's a, a control on the recording mixer called a panoramic potentiometer, or pan-pot. Um, and that works, as you can see on the bottom of this slide, um, as, a, as a control which goes between extreme left at its anti-clockwise position to extreme right at its clockwise, most clockwise position. Um, and positions in between move the, 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 the selected track to a position within the stereo image. Um, and that's one way that uh, stereo records are made, and 95% of all stereo records are made that way. Um, uh, rock, pop, country, electronic dance music, you name it, it all uses really that technique. Um, and in that particular case, Bride of Frankenstein is better because this is a theoretically exact system when you have a particular interchannel ratio it's identical between left and right and that consequently you want the precise um, correction that, that the Bride of Frankenstein applies. However there are an enormously important collection of stereo recordings which are made by microphone techniques, stereo microphone techniques, and that would be the majority of classical recordings, really. Um, now, classical recordings use um, various microphone techniques, but they all real microphones tend to exhibit an important effect whereby they become more directional with high frequencies, uh, just due to the physics of the, uh, of the way air interacts with, uh, and vibrations interact with the um, housing of the microphone itself. So this is an example here of a figure of eight microphone, obvious reasons, that's a, like it looks like an eight. Um, and you can see that at high frequencies, which are the dotted lines, um, the, the eight narrows, so it becomes more narrow with, uh, with frequency. Um, now, if you make a stereo recording like this, it exaggerates the already widening effect um, that exists in, in a theoretically... Um, theoretically perfect stereo system, if you like, so that as the, as the signals become more, as the microphones become more directional with high frequency, it, it widens the uh, image even more at high frequencies. And that may well be the origin of the value um, selected by the EMI team, because they were actually compensating not only for the system itself, but also for the, the anomalies within the microphones. So actually overcooking the the high frequency correction, as we saw in the graphs for Bride of Frankenstein, is actually appropriate. And all that to say that really for pan stereo sources, the Bride of Frankenstein is the best algorithm, and for a microphone array stereo, so we could think about classical recordings, uh, concerto, uh, symphonies, whatever, um, they're best, probably best processed with the Frankenstein, the original Frankenstein circuit. Here we're going to look at the Frankenstein FS1. 
The FS1 was a studio processor and intended to be more dramatic than the, uh, than the principally hi-fi uh, Frankenstein original uh, unit. Um, and clearly there's two ways you can correct for this wide widening of the uh, stereo image at high frequencies. You can either narrow the high frequencies, which is what's done in the hi-fi processor, or for a more dramatic effect, you can widen the low frequencies. There are methods by which you can to make the, the, the LF image a wider. Um, and that generates a much more dramatic effect of a, of a slightly over-wide, bigger stereo image. Now we'll move on to the ARIA upconverter algorithms. So not Area 51, uh, top research, but uh, ARIA 51. Uh, and this is our algorithm for taking a standard stereo signal and generating a pseudo 5.1 signal for listening to those, um, those recordings on a, on a 5.1 system. Um, the, the algorithm uses principal components analysis to adjust the parameters of the up conversion. Uh, so we look at channel difference and channel and sum uh, and we look at the correlation between them and make adjustments as to how much uh, information can be passed to the rear speakers. And because not all up conversion will require the LFE signal, there's a version also of, uh, of ARIA for 5.0 and for more professional uh, applications where you may want to keep the center channel free uh, for dialogue. Um, the, there's a 4.0 version. It should be said that this 5.1 up conversion in stereo source is fairly unique. Well, it is, it is unique in, in that we use the center signal, even when it is present, to implement the Frankenstein correction. So uh, there's not much that comes out the, the center speaker, but what is there is, is there to, to, to correct uh, and to, to provide Frankenstein correction. So quite a unique 5.1 uh, up conversion algorithm. Right, now we come on to two uh, headphone uh, algorithms, headphone entirely for headphones. Neither of these algorithms are suitable for loudspeaker reproduction. The first of these is Headspace, which uses a head-related transfer function um, method so that it takes the two loudspeaker signals and creates the crosstalk that exists in, uh, in real life when you listen to, to stereo signals um, in, in a room. Um, so the first effect, if you like, is that the left-hand signal, the left-hand the left loudspeaker, does actually make it to your right ear. It's not like it's completely glued to the ear as it is in a headphone. Um, it, there are crosstalk components, admittedly filtered by the, um, by the shape of the head, and that's what's being um, modelled here. Uh, and then in a parallel process, there's a reverberation algorithm. So the other thing that happens when you listen in a room is the room itself. It's the sound of the, of the, of the, of the audio bouncing off the walls and coming back to you. So both of those things are, um, are modeled within Headspace. And the, the result of it is, is that when you listen on headphones to, uh, to an audio signal, it sounds as if it's come out of the head and there's no longer a drummer, a tiny drummer sitting in the position of your pituitary gland. Uh, the, the audio externalizes to some degree outside the head. And it's particularly effective on uh, those early recordings or, or blue note jazz recordings, for instance, where you have uh, one instrument in one channel and the other instruments in the other. And think, for instance, of the early Beatles records. When listened to on headphones, those sound really very peculiar indeed. Um, and that takes away this effect because you get a much more balanced, blended sound uh, as you do when you listen through loudspeakers. ARIA 2.0 is a two-channel fold-down of the ARIA 5.1 process, so uh, somewhat ironic in that we up-convert the stereo to, to 5.1 and then fold it back down to 2.0, which doesn't mean ignoring the rear channels, by the way. So it, it's, it's a, it's a fold-down including the extra information that's been generated via the up-conversion process.
works quite well for classical um, material particularly. So now we come to the phonograph uh, section of Stereosource, which is quite an extensive part of, of the software. Uh, phono equalization comes about because of the mechanical nature of recording audio onto a, onto a gramophone record. Um, when, when a record is recorded on a, on a lathe, as it's called the recording lathe, um, there's a mechanism very much like a loudspeaker which wobbles a stylus and that stylus engraves the original groove in the, in the, very, in the lacquer master. Um, and if you ever watched a loudspeaker moving, you'll see, you remember that it moves a lot for bass notes and doesn't move very much at all for, for treble notes. And the, the, the cutter on a disc is exactly the same for, for the same physical reasons. Um, and what it means was, is if it was allowed to wobble as much as, as much as it would like to at low frequencies, it would overcut. And what that, what that means is that as the next groove comes round, it, it wobbles so much it cuts into the previous one. And clearly it's wrecked if it does that. Um, uh, and then, so there's a necessity to cut the bass frequencies as you record a disc. And whilst you're cutting the bass frequencies, you might as well boost the high frequencies because that gives you better noise. So the, uh, the, the, the overall signal recorded onto a, onto a record, what's actually coming out of the grooves or going in and coming back out of the grooves, is actually a very, very shrill, strident signal with virtually all the bass rolled off and all the treble boosted. Um, and that's the complementary characteristic that has to be implemented when the record is replayed. So having cut the bass, you need to boost it back up again. And having boosted the treble, you have to cut it. And so the, the characteristic is, is that. And there's a very famous curve called RIAA, um, which was the equalization which was largely adopted from about the 1960s onwards. And we'll come to some complications regarding that later. Um, most phono amplifiers implement this RA, AA cre correction, as they call it, within the circuitry uh, of the preamplifier. And whilst there's some very good units, the best are very expensive. Uh, and we believe that it would be uh, very good to, to implement this correction in the digital domain within Stereosource. And of course, being in software, you can do it very, very accurately. You're not relying on real world capacitors and resistors that change their value with time and temperature it just it's just numbers um, and so here's some spot frequencies and you can get very very accurate uh, RIAA correction now if all discs were perfect and absolutely flat and all turntable bearings had a perfect surface finish and uh, arms didn't resonate with the compliance of the of the of the cartridge there would be no such thing as we call rumble, so all the, all the low frequency um, crud which comes out of uh, real, when you pay, replay records, made much worse, of course, by RAAA equalization with masses and masses of, of bass uh, boost. Um, so there's a need in all practical systems to, to filter um, the signal coming out of a groove because otherwise really there's just masses and masses of LF information which causes cone flap and intermodulation all sorts of problems in analog there's not much option but to use well there is no option but to use um, st steep cut filters of, of one kind or another and whilst they're very good at getting rid of the low frequency information they cause masses of uh, phase uh, phase distortion around the turnover point particularly um, now, whilst you can argue about the audibility of phase at high frequencies in audio, you, you can't when you're talking around 20 hertz. It's certainly the case that these filters have audible effects because they are creating quite large phase distortions. And, and phase, uh, you know, a 30 or 90 degree phase distortion of a, of a wave that has a, a wavelength of 10 feet is, is you know, 4 feet. So you're, you're creating a situation where the, the base frequencies are, are displaced from the, the high frequencies by several feet in, in real terms. So um, phase distortion at, at LF really is a, a real effect and something you can do in software or in the digital domain you can't do in the analog domain is to um, have filters with two-sided exponentials that are linear, linear phase 
uh, and that's exactly what is implemented in, in Stereosource, so a very steep cut uh, linear phase filter. Well, I mentioned RIAA, but RIAA was, um, was developed after a, a period of fairly chaotic uh, situation in recording uh, gramophone records since, you know, since the early days in the 30s. Um, and during that period, all the different labels had different corrections that they thought were better or worse or implemented or maximized what they could get out of the medium um, as they thought fit. Um, and what it meant was is that records were recorded largely with lots of different um, equalizations. Um, and it meant that in the 1950s, and on the, the table on the left there, it was quite common in hi-fi magazines, that's a real one that comes from a hi-fi magazine in the late, in the late 50s, which has all the different labels down it and says, oh, if you're listening to a, to a Oiseau Lair record, you need to select this equalization. And if you're listening to a Decca record, you have to select this equalization. Um, and it's my belief, as well as a lot of other people, that a lot of these equalizations went on a lot longer than people think. There's this idea that in 1955 there was this sudden bonhomie amongst uh, record companies and everybody started to adopt the RIAA system. I don't think that's true. There are certainly lots of records a lot later than that that seem to seem to benefit from being recorded with, with other equalizations. And Stereos Source implements um, an encyclopedic set of curves. So we have EMI, HMV, BSI, DECA, NAB, RCA, BBC, Columbia and AES uh, and others including coarse groove and, and um, several 78 characteristics. Um, we have a, as part of the help files there's a big spreadsheet which explains uh, what label should use which particular equalization and uh, it's quite surprising when you take a uh, re-equalize these records having always listened to them in RIAA how much livelier they sound, how much more realistic they sound, it's, it's quite remarkable. But of course it does beg the question how do I get a flat disc recording because the majority of uh, disc amplifiers, deep disc preamplifiers of course implement RIAA as they should. Well there are two solutions, uh, the first one is to use uh, one of the filters that we have built into Stereosource called an RIAA stripper and what that does is it, it uses a, a reverse characteristic to take an RAAA recorded uh, or an, yes an RAAA equalized pickup response and it strips off that RAAA um, equalization leaving you effectively with what the signal is coming out of the groove um, and the algorithm we've used there is to take the transfer function of a Neumann SE66 recording equalizer. So we've used exactly the same circuit. Of course, it's not a circuit; it's a it's an algorithm, um, and and used this to to process the audio. So effectively, you've got back to as near as you possibly can to to the signal coming directly out of the disc uh, out of the disc groove. But an even better way to do that, of course, is to is to record directly what's really coming out of the groove rather than have it equalized and then strip off the equalization actually to listen to the signal coming directly out of the groove itself um, we've developed our own um, hardware enabled to, to, enabled to do that and um, we've called this hardware the groove sleuth preamplifier it was developed preamplifiers there are various versions they were developed by us as part of testing stereo source, we, we needed a set of very, very accurate, very low noise and high performance wide bandwidth um, preamplifiers. And it was very, very hard to find a commercial um, unit we could use. So, the, uh, so we developed our own and the Groove Sleuth preamplifiers come out of those developments. Um, it's, a, it's a two box unit. In fact, you can just see the preamplifier part there. There's a there's a matching power supply uh, box as well. They have this uh, solid copper polished front panel, which is uh, there to look nice and also to act as a heat sink for the low noise circuitry inside. Uh, once again, as part of our development, we whilst it's interesting to listen to the signal which comes out directly off the groove of a record, it's actually very strident and shrill. 
um, and in fact becomes quite fatiguing after listening to for, for a very short while. Um, and so we decided that um, what would be a very good idea would be to have a loop circuit or even an RIAA hardware circuit so that you could take that signal and actually whilst you were recording to the computer the flat signal to actually listen to the uh, to actually listen to the record in a comfortable way uh, and we we developed so there, there are two options for the loop you can actually ha either have a conventional RIAA uh, loop and then come out at line level to feed your preamp or we've got a very wide bin very wide bandwidth very low distortion um, loop option called iLoop and it's intelligent loop because it detects what kind of phono input it's been sent to so if it's sent to a moving magnet input it will adjust its level accordingly and automatically and if it's sent to a moving coil input it will do the same so you can have a very very wide band very low distortion and effectively listen to your records as you always have and that's the back of the groove sleuth unit and you can see the three uh, phono, uh, three phono groups there. So the extreme left uh, group being the left and right input, the extreme right being the uh, output to the computer, and the middle one being the I loop or RAA. The Groove Sleuth also has a USB uh, audio streaming option. So in fact, it can be used to as a complete capture system so you could either feed the, the the flat analog signal out of the standard a groove sleuth to a to an audio card uh, or you can use the groove sleuth with the usb option which allows direct connection to the computer it also incorporates a dac so very high quality 24-bit 96 kilohertz dac so that you can actually use it to replay all your computer audio as well so with one uh, with one unit you can actually completely glue your computer into your hi-fi system. So now we come to the quadraphonic and ambisonic part of Stereosource. So let's look first at quadraphonics. Uh, quadraphonics is, is rather a dirty word these days and everybody thinks of 1970s skullduggery and uh, and record company greed and there's a good good point to that because that's what killed it but quadraphonics nonetheless was a was a very clever system that's kind of a fun advert from the 1970s which i think uh, just shows why people think uh, <laughs> think that quadraphonic is so cheesy But nonetheless, many beautiful and important recordings were made in quadraphonic and versions of many classic recordings were mixed in quad. And there's just some examples there. There's a, there's a Fauré Requiem uh, in the middle. But uh, there's also Dark Side of the Moon, Imagine. Um, there are many, many records which were recorded in quad format. Uh, and there are, some of them are very serious artistic value. And it's impossible to listen to them unless you have very old quad gear. So we decided to incorporate quad decoding within stereo source. And the formats we support are SQ and QS. Uh, and they are decoded so they can be replayed over a modern 5.1 system. So a sort of classic 5.1, which many people have in their homes. The input file are always stereo of course just as it comes off the record or or tape indeed and it's not necessarily a a vinyl based um, phenomenon this though there are plenty of qs and sq recordings in other media um, so we take this two channel stereophonic input and then the output may be encoded in various ways you can encode it to uh, to mono files five mono files that you might want if you were going to do dts encoding for instance or you can do it as a series of stereo files, so left and right, left and left back and right back, um, and center and LFE. Or you can encode it, encode it to a multi-channel file. And the file formats we support are uh, WAV, um, Broadcast WAV, uh, AIF, F, AIF, FC, and and FLAC. And then we come to Ambisonics, um, which was the brainchild of, uh, of various 
UK academics, particularly Michael Gerzen. Um, and really, ambisonics, if, if you like, is the thinking man quadraphonic, quadraphonics, although its, it's ambitions went way beyond uh, quadraphonic. But as far as stereo source is concerned, the, the, the aspect that we're keen to, to support is stereo UHJ. Uh, ambisonic signals could be encoded to a compatible stereo format called stereo UHJ. Um, and the interesting part of this is, is that there is a huge catalogue of stereo UHJ uh, recordings, mainly because the, the UK record company Nimbus um, have recorded all their catalogue, virtually all their catalogue, in this format for the last 30 years. So there are hundreds, if not thousands, of CDs available in this format, and often of very great artistic merit. So it's very interesting to be able to decode these and listen to them on a modern multi-channel system. Uh, ambisonics is quite a complicated area and uh, we allow for various different types of decoding um, in, uh, in stereo source. For a stereo UHJ signal we have a controlled opposites decoder, energy optimized, velocity optimized. Um, people who are interested in ambisonics will know what that is. Uh, we also have our own optimization which we developed which we call the spatial audio optimized decoder and we include uh, Wiggins 5.1 um, encoder algorithm as well. Now we come to two uh, algorithms designed for professional microphone processing. Uh, Bloomline Delta, which in fact is probably, well it is the oldest technique in stereo, and Crossfors, which is a, uh, which is a modern technique developed by us. So Bloomline Delta derives from actually the very first experiments that Bloomline did in stereophony, or he called it binaural stereo, back in 1928. Um, and that far back, there were no figure of eight, let alone cardioid um, microphones. In fact, there were only pressure microphones. So he, his original um, capture system, if you like, his original microphone array, consisted of two omnis separated by about the interaural, uh, the interaural space, so what, nine inches or something, um, separated by a block of wood. So in other words, really a, a dummy head type recording. Um, and he developed electronics to convert the signals from this dummy head to loudspeaker signals based entirely on um, interchannel level differences. So in other words, he got rid of the, 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 the phase differences which exist on a, on a dummy head and turned them back into intensity differences. And he invented a circuit to do that, which he confusingly called a shuffler, uh, which was the name used again by the post-war team to do their image correction effect. So this was the original shuffler. Um, and th this particular invention um, was called by no less than Michael Gerzen the greatest forgotten invention in audio engineering. Uh, in Stereo Source, we implement a, a version of uh, Bloomline's binaural technique uh, in digital, in a modern digital implementation. The advantage being that you can use two near-spaced omni microphones to generate uh, completely compatible, mono-compatible um, stereo recordings. Um, and that's interesting because a lot of people prefer omni microphones to cardioid or or, um, or figure of eight because of their, because of the, the more generally open sound. And lastly, we look at the technique which we call cross fours. Now, this is a uh, crossed cardioids. Cross cardioids are often used for stereo recordings rather than crossed figure of eights. The reason being is they have a suppressed rear lobe, and that means that you can they pick up less um, ambient sound and consequently can be used a bit further away from the from the ensemble. The advantage being that you get better blend like that. 
But the problem with cross cardioids is they don't really provide enough interchannel level differences, especially not at LF. And that's shown in the graph here, the, the top curves being the LF channel difference and the bottom curves being the HF ones. Now, the LF ones are, are the theoretical curves, if you like, and the HF are caused, the, the, the better HF uh, differences are caused by the fact that the microphones beam at high frequencies. So, in fact, there's only at um, the maximum interchannel difference you can get from a cardio. It is only about three three dB, which is nothing like enough to give you proper stereo. Uh, and the only reason they work is, as I said, because of these exaggerated HF cues. Uh, another way to understand this is to to look at the cardioid response. Now, a cardioid response is defined by that uh, by the little equation there um, but the important forget the half just look at the one plus cos theta now the what that means is that it's a one which is a response in all directions in other words an omnidirectional response plus a cosine response now a cosine response is a figure of eight response so some fa some people call figure of eight microphones cosine microphones because of that so you can think of a of a cardioid microphone as being the sum of a figure of eight microphone with a mono microphone. So two cross cardioids means two cross figure of eight microphones summed with two coincident mono microphones. So uh, omni microphones, which of course is a mono microphone. And it's fairly obvious when you look at that, that this isn't going to work very well because you're taking a, a stereo microphone array and mixing in at 50% a purely mono signal. And that's what fails to give you decent stereo. And the, this is one of the reasons that, that cross-cardioid recordings are very often accused of not having any low-end bloom or being a bit narrow or a bit analytical and dry sounding. And it's not surprising because actually what's happening is it's only really the HF which is being encoded in stereo purely because the microphones are beaming um, and that's then dominating over the, the mono microphones, if you like. Um, so the advantage... Um, the disadvantage of cross, cross cardioids is that they create this rather dry sound. But it is possible mathematically to, to get this mono response and to, to, to subtract it, but because of various polarity issues, when you do, you lose the rear, the rear um, lobes to the, to the cosine responses. So what you end up is with two half cosine responses uh, pointing left and right. Um, and uh, the advantage of that is you end up with a with a nice stereo recording with less reverb um, and with with a suppressed rear lobe and because they're half an eight we call that cross fours now we come on to the post processing in in stereo source and the the, mo the majority of that is a groove it probably doesn't need me to tell you that vinyl cells are the biggest in 20 years. There's a huge um, resurgence of interest in vinyl. And this was uh, our attempt to, to generate something which we thought uh, was pretty close to a vinyl replay from digital files. So there are various artifacts in vi vinyl replay which may have perceptual benefits. One of them is Frankenstein. And in fact, the groove should always be used with Frankenstein. So Frankenstein provides the stereo correction. And there are various mechanisms within a, a phono cartridge which, to some degree, produce something like a Frankenstein effect. So one would normally program Frankenstein as the, as the pre-process and groove as the secondary process. Groove has two algorithms included in it. Uh, which is one which models the, the effect of the stylus moving within a groove. So it models the physics of that, uh, of that interaction. And also it models the, the granularity of the, of the vinyl material and, the, and, the, and the, the diamond moving within it, equalized by the RAAA preamplifier. And uh, you have some degree of control over those, uh, over those parameters, but by default they're typical values that you get from a 12 inch LP. Uh, there are some reasons that they may be uh, psychologically uh, enhancing. The stylus model to some degree generates a certain amount of second harmonic distortion and there's some evidence to suggest that sounds better uh, and the surface model perhaps produces a kind of psychological dither, um, gives some sort of baseline from which we, we like to listen from. And, and those are modeled in here. So the idea being that you take a, 
uh, a CD audio at 44.1, for example, it will then up-convert it. All Groove algorithms up-convert, so it becomes a, a dual-rate file, uh, and then various um, the, the two models are applied, the stylus model and the surface model, the result being, um, after the Frankenstein uh, enhancement, uh, a signal which sounds very, very like that which comes off the outer grooves of, a, of an LP record. And lastly, I think we all uh, are bored of the, the loudness wars, and uh, because, because stereo source um, will find itself in the hands of a curator of music collections, either private or, or more erudite, the software contains signal measurement to, to allow loudness correction. And we've used the ITU BS1770-3 alg um, algorithms and standards, uh, which, are, which are used in broadcast. Um, we have advice in the help files as to set target values for, for music collections. Stereosource comes in in three versions plus a free demo version. Uh, which is restricted to 10 conversions and limited to two minutes of conversion. So you can try everything in the demo version, it's free. Um, and then if you decide to convert, there are three options. So the basic home version uh, includes Frankenstein, Headspace, 5.1 up conversion and RIAA. But the sampling rates are restricted to 44.1 and 48. Uh, the Tommeister version uh, includes Bride of Frankenstein as well as the, as well as the microphone uh, processing options, so Bloomline Delta and the uh, crossed fours, uh, and it does support all sampling rates, all, all dual rate sampling rates. And then finally the top end audio file version has the groove processing and has all the historic gramophone recording characteristics. And all those features are summarized in a table which is in the help files. Uh, Stereosource has extensive help files with it, with lots of background, full chapters from books. There's the Stereosonic paper, which is reproduced in full. Lots and lots of background information about the filters. Thank you for listening.